I'm really, really happy to see you guys. Always happy to see you. Um, can I share something with you? Every single week, I'm kind of a workaholic. So when Sabbath comes around, I get real anxious and nervous because my work's not finished. And that anxiety doesn't go away until I get here and start to see you guys and hang out with you, hear all the different testimonies. That's when actually all the anxiety starts to go away. So really, really happy to see you. Keeping in step with our garden of prayer this morning, our message this morning is entitled The Mark of Love. And I really just want to be able to convey to you this morning how much God loves us. Because he really does love us. And I hope I can really relay that to you. Uh, please join me for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so, so much that you brought us together this morning. We know that there's some people that didn't make it through this week. And we feel blessed, we feel privileged that you're allowing us to worship you, come together as a family. We thank you that you're receiving our praises. We thank you that you're receiving our prayers. We just want to thank you for everything that you're doing for us. And we thank you for these things because we know we don't deserve them. We appreciate you. We love you. And we just want to thank you for being here with us. And this morning, you know that this message you've put on my heart to share with our family about your love is not something that I can deliver without you here. So I'm inviting your spirit to be here with us this morning, that you can relay this message to your people the way you see fit. And we thank you for all that you do. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Can you guys hear me all right? All right. You know, several, um, several years ago, my friends and I were invited to the grand opening of a very elegant nightclub down in Las Olas. And right at the entrance, there was a handful of girls. I think they were waiting for the owner. Uh, one of them caught my attention because she had a lot of tattoos on her body. And I had the opportunity to read one of those tattoos written right across her arm. And it said, every sin leaves a mark. Now, I wasn't a Christian at the time. I didn't have a relationship with God. But I can tell you that I understood that tattoo on a very deep spiritual level. Because at that point in my life, I had made a lot of poor choices, a lot of poor decisions. And I knew and I was very clear on how much sin marks your life. You see, when you're little, your parents try to instill values in you. They try to teach you about the ways of God. But when you grow up, you make all these choices sometimes and you depart. And you ultimately experience the consequences of those sins. And I was very, very clear at that point in my life how sin had marked me. So I didn't need any explanation about that tattoo. But I also understood a bigger statement that this tattoo was making. What this young lady was saying was, don't judge me for the markings on my body because we all have marks that are not visible to the naked eye. Sometimes you see people that have tattoos on their necks, tattoos on their faces, tattoos on their whole torso, tattoos on their arms. And a very common reaction to that is to be taken back. And many of us, most of us will tell you, oh, I'd never get a tattoo on my face. That's what most people will say. I'll never put a tattoo on my neck. That's what a lot of people will say. But what I've come to understand and what I've come to learn is that those people with the tattoos on their face, on their bodies and all those visible places, they are a more accurate representation of how we look spiritually when we're marked by sin. You see, sin is not discreet. Sin is not neat. Sin is not conservative. Sin is aggressive. Sin is invasive. Sin is right up in your face. So as much as we want to hide from that fact, we want to run away from this idea that we're marked, that every single one of us is marked. We are all marked by sin. Every single one of us. We, we do a really good job of covering it up. We cover it up with clothes, cars, cologne, careers. We do a good job of distancing ourselves from anything that will remind us of this core truth and this core reality that every single one of us is marked by sin. 
that we are marked, that we're desperate, that we're in need of a savior, that without God, we're all in the same sinking ship. We've developed a lot of different metrics, performance metrics that allow us to excel in different areas. We do really well in this area or that area and it allows us to feel a degree of comfort that we're probably just a little bit better than that guy. You might hear people tell you all the time, you know, I know I'm not perfect, but look what he did. I know I'm not perfect, but look what she did. Look what she's doing. You see, we love to distance ourselves from what other people are doing. So we came up with a lot of these different metrics that we judge ourselves by. But there's no performance that can distinguish you from one another. There's no performance that can make me better than you. We are all in the same exact sinking ship. We are all marked by the same sin. We have all been born into the same environment of sin and we can't get around it. The best illustration that I could give you of this is one that you probably heard 50,000 times, but I have to use it because it's the most relevant, right? You guys know me, many of you know that I'm not very athletic. That's an understatement. I got two left feet, very clumsy on the court. The one thing I can guarantee you is an air ball. <laughs> you want to put your money on something? Put your money on that. I'll give you an air ball, right? I'm not very athletic. So it's safe to say that Michael Jordan can jump considerably higher than I can. Is that safe to say? But if the goal is to high five the moon, to slap the backboard of the moon, the actual moon, then both of us fall miserably short of our goal. In this case, when it comes to slapping a high five on the moon, me and Michael Jordan are in the same athletic class. LeBron too, right Tom? We're in the same athletic class. That probably makes Michael really, really mad because he works so hard to have, to be more fit, to have more skills, to be able to win more championships, and he works so hard. And it's real hard to hear that you work so hard to distinguish yourself from the rest, but then you can be lumped in the same category that we're all in the same sinking ship. That doesn't sit well with a lot of people. That's probably what happened with the kid from the prodigal son story, right? The kid that stayed home. He stayed home and he was very well-mannered, well-behaved. He was following all the rules and the guidelines of his dad. Then his brother goes out, squanders the money, spends time with people out in the parties and does all this crazy mess. And then he discovers that the father loves both of them the same. How dare he celebrate him? I work hard so that I can be the one that is celebrated. How could you put me in the same class as him? He doesn't deserve to be celebrated. He didn't listen to your rules. He didn't listen to anything that you wanted us to follow. How could you celebrate him? That's the feeling that we get when we hear that we're in the same sinking boat. All of us. We get mad because we work very hard to get more education, more intelligence, more square footage on our homes, more degrees, more certifications. We work hard to distinguish ourselves and then we're lumped into the same category as the rest to be told that we are all desperate and in need of a savior because we have the same core sinful nature. How do I get you to understand this? The best way that I can get you to understand this is this. You hear a lot of talk about how sugar is bad for you, sugar's terrible for you, sugar's gonna kill you, right? So my wife and I, we decided that we're gonna go sugar busting. We're gonna limit our sugar intake. So we decided we're gonna put only one spoon of sugar in our cups of coffee. One spoon for her, one spoon for me. Just one spoon. The problem with this master plan is that I love sugar. One spoon for her, one spoon for me. My wife, on the other hand, she doesn't really like sugar. I don't think she, she can't stand sugar. To be honest with you, I think she really only just puts sugar in her coffee to be politically correct. She just doesn't want people to accuse her of sugar discrimination. <laughs> She'll probably tell you some of my best friends are sugar. 
Me, on the other hand, I'm a big fan of sugar. I actually have an I Love Sugar t-shirt. So I started trying this. I wanted to go with it. So I started to do this for a few days. And it was just annoying. I hated the way this coffee tasted. So I came up with a great idea. I started pouring more of the coffee into her cup and a little less of the coffee in my cup. So my coffee tasted a little sweeter and she was enjoying that black water she likes to drink, right? Brilliant plan, but check this out. The reality is we each had the same exact sugar intake, one spoon. I intake the same amount of sugar that she took, one spoon of sugar. So if sugar was gonna kill her, sugar was gonna kill me because we had the same exact amount of sugar, even though she had more coffee in her sugar and I had less. You see, that's all sin is. It's no different. You and I did not inherit sin any differently. You inherited sin the same exact way that I inherited sin. You got it from Adam and Eve just like I got it from Adam and Eve. I didn't have a greater dose of sin than you got. You didn't get a greater dose of sin than I got. We got the same exact amount of dose of sin. What we're seeing when we're seeing people's behavior is we're seeing different expressions of the same exact sinful nature. Different manifestations of the same exact nature. The same thing that makes a person steal a candy bar is the same thing that makes a person go out and you know, rob, rob, uh, beat up on someone. It's the nature that causes the behavior. And what you'll discover is that a lot of this behavior is really learned behavior. It's behavior that we pick up from where we grew up. A person might have grown up in an environment where they're comfortable with tattoos because that's what everybody does in that environment. A person might grow up in an environment where they're comfortable with profanity because that's what goes on in that environment. So that becomes their adopted expression of their sinful nature. It doesn't mean that they're more sinful, but we love to judge one another for our different expressions of our sinful nature. For example, I like to drive in the fast lane, the, the far left lane, because it tends to be kind of empty. So I love to go 85 in that lane. I'm driving 85. <laughs> But there's always some guy that pops up behind me and starts tailgating me. Get out the way, get out the way. And my wife's like, baby, you're driving too slow, move. And I'm like, I'm driving too slow? I'm driving 85 miles an hour, how am I too slow? Why does he have to go 90 miles an hour? Why does he have to go 100? So in my mind, I have justified that my 85 miles an hour is better than his 100 miles an hour, but here's the thing. The speed limit is 70. The speed limit is 65. From the minute you go 61, 66 or you go 71, you've already in violation. If both of us get pulled over, the cop is entitled to give both of us a speeding ticket because I have exceeded the speed limit just like he's exceeded the speed limit. But somehow, I feel more that my conservative 85 is better <laughs> than his aggressive 105. But what I realize is that we sin according to our comfort level. We only sin based on the stuff that we're comfortable doing. So you're comfortable holding a grudge with that person and not forgiving them for five years. But you're not comfortable punching that guy in the face. You're comfortable telling a white lie to the IRS but you're not comfortable robbing a grocery store. Most of the discomfort comes from some of the human laws that we've set up. Not necessarily because we're more moral. Not necessarily because we're less of a sinner. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. Every single one of us is marked. Marked by sin. And the truth is, the truth, truth, truth is, the spiritually speaking, I probably look a lot more like Little Wayne than this clean cut guy I'm trying to present to you today. Spiritually speaking, I'm all tatted up. You see, because I got a tattoo on my shoulder that I obtained just based on 
being a part of an organization that was more of a brotherhood. So I bought into the concept, I was in the brotherhood and we all got tattoos and we signified our brotherhood. It's not for fashion or cosmetic reasons. I'm not into tattoos fashionably, so I didn't put it in a very conspicuous place. It's in a discreet place that you probably won't see it, it's on my shoulder. You wouldn't see it unless we went to the beach, unless we're in a setting where you could see me with my shirt off. But it's there. Is it any different than the guy with the tattoo on his face? It's no different. We're both marked up. It's no different, but somehow we put classes on our sins. We put labels and we look at the sins that we commit because we're comfortable. I'm more of a conservative guy. I wouldn't put it in a cons conspicuous place. I'm not into it fashionably. I wouldn't put it in a conspicuous place, but I'm still marked up. And we're all marked up because every sin leaves a mark. Every single sin. So, without Christ, all of our tattoos would be visible to God. All of our spiritual tattoos would be visible to God. He'd be able to see all of them, but Christ is the one that covers us up. But this is a really, really hopeless situation for us. Because the wage of sin is death. The logic in this is that sin, the definition of sin, is to separate, is, is to rebel against the rule of God, is to rebel against the rule of God, to break the rules, transgression, violation of the rule of God. So if God says to go right and you're going the opposite direction, you're being separated from God and that's what sin does. Sin separates us from God. So if you're being separated from the source of life, then where are you headed? If you're being separated from the source of life, then where are you headed? Death. So that's why the consequence, the wage of sin is death. So technically speaking, the payment for your sin, when you die, you've paid your sins. You die, all of your sins are wiped away clean because you die. But now, how can you be resurrected? You had a debt, and you paid the debt. The wage of sin is death. How is it possible that a person can be resurrected? This is a hopeless, hopeless situation. But just at the right time, our key text for this morning is Romans chapter six, chapter five, verses six to eight. Just at the right time, while we were still powerless, in this powerless situation, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a religious person or a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? Seriously, this idea of Christ dying for the ungodly, the people that separated themselves from him, the people that decided they don't want nothing to do with him, the people that said, I want to go my own way, I'm rebelling, I have been created by you, but I'm interested in going my own direction, I'm not interested in following your rule, I don't want anything to do with you. Do you understand what it means that Christ died let me see if I can explain it. I'm gonna try my best. Complex, but I'm gonna try my best. If you open up a bank account and you got zero dollars in it, there's no money in it, you deposit $100, $100, right? And you decide that tomorrow you need the $100 back. You wanna withdraw the $100. You can go to the bank and you can withdraw $100, okay? But if you had any transactions, on your account, bought some bubble gum, put some gas, paid for your phone, any transactions at all, you no longer have $100. So now you can't withdraw $100. The only person that can go to the bank and withdraw a whole $100 is the person who didn't have any transactions 
against his hundred dollars. This is the same exact way it works. From the time we became sinners, we became imperfect. There's no way that an imperfect being can meet the perfect standards of a perfect God. Only someone who is perfect, only someone with no charges against their account can be resurrected when they die. When he dies, he can be resurrected because he wasn't supposed to die to begin with. He didn't have any sins against his account. He was sinless. And we know that when humanity became sinless, every single one of us became sinless. Sinful, 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 sinful. When humanity became sinful, every single one of us became sinful. God was looking around the earth if he could only find one. There was none, not one person that could represent humanity and actually be sacrificed as a perfect sacrifice without sin that would be entitled to be resurrected. Not one. If the salt has lost its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? None of us could have redeemed ourselves. It took only a person with a perfect record, a person with a perfect standing, and the only person, the only person with that standing is God. Because who? We know that the serpent, Satan, in the form of the serpent, was rebellious, took angels with him. We, he was rebellious. We know that Eve was rebellious. She sinned. She ate the fruit. We know that Adam went right behind her and he ate the fruit. Everybody in that story was contaminated. The only person that wasn't contaminated is God. The only person that really didn't go against himself was God. Everybody was against God. The entire world was at war with God. The entire world was an enemy of God. The only person that could solve this problem is God. So here you have majestic, royal, on his throne, everything at his beck and call, being worshiped, being celebrated, God of all things, governing, controlling, just being God, leaving his kingdom, his riches, his wealth, to come down to a place where everybody hates his guts, rejects him, prepare to slap him, spit on him, beat him, betray him. That's what it means to come down and to sacrifice your life for people who hate your guts. That's what it means. People who hate your guts, who don't want anything to do with you, says just at the right time when we were powerless, when we were in a situation that we couldn't do nothing about because we're imperfect and we can't meet the standards of a perfect God because we're imperfect, we are powerless. Just at the right time while we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Ungodly, people who were not interested in having a relationship with God. The ungodly. God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Do you understand what that means? And then, here's the most beautiful part. The most beautiful part. It's the most beautiful part. God, when Christ is resurrected, because he wasn't supposed to lose his life to begin with, because he was innocent, He's entitled, legally entitled, to take up his life again, right? But the life that he takes up is an eternal life because his life has always been eternal to begin with. He takes up an eternal life. I don't know how I can explain this to you, but I'm going to try again, okay? I'm going to try to explain it to you. I don't know how to explain the complex existence of God. How you can be one, but three. He's only revealed to us three personalities of his divine family. I don't know if there's more. I don't know. But he's told us there's the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and they existed as one, inseparable as one in eternity. We try to explain it with the Trinity. We try to give this explanation, but we don't really explain it that well. But the one thing that I do know is that he's taught us 
everything reproduces according to its own kind. So if a chicken has a child, then it's going to be a chicken. If a dog has a child, then it's going to be a dog. If a human being has a child, then it's going to be a human. So what would you say the Son of God is? His existence is eternal. Mine was, it had a beginning. A chicken's existence had a beginning. A dog's existence had a beginning. But as we know, God has no beginning, has no end. So anyone in that same nature, anyone that has that same nature, anyone that is God in nature doesn't have a beginning. So his existence is an eternal existence. The Son of God has an eternal existence from beginning, eternal, never had a beginning, never had an end, never will have an end. So Christ takes up an eternal life when he's resurrected. And that's the life he shares with us. That's the beautiful part. That is the life that he shares with us, a life that is abundant, that he can now legally, because he took the form of human beings, represents humanity and can now give you abundant life. Abundant life. You can be resurrected in Christ and live eternally because of his eternal existence. He put it on the line for you, for me, even though we did not deserve it. What Jesus accomplished in doing this is amazing. And it also teaches us how to love. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 to 44, he says, you heard it said that love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. And then he goes on to say in John chapter 15, verses thir verse 13, greater love has no one than this, than to lay one's life down for one's friend. These two verses, he's explaining to us how to love. He's explaining to us that love is not predicated on lovability. And he's explaining to us that the greatest de demonstration of love is to actually put your life on the line for another. And in that one action of dying for us, he demonstrated both of those things. He demonstrated that love, his love for us is not predicated on us being lovable because we're not lovable. Without him working in us, the ugliness of humanity comes out. We want to run from it. We've come up ways of masking it, of disguising it. We've come up with systems of covering it up. We've come up ways to make ourselves very respectable. We're very cleaned up. But if we were left to our own devices and we were left to be us, the ugly that comes out, you wouldn't believe. I'll, I'll, I'll admit to you that my wife and I watch Scandal. <gasps> In an episode of Scandal, probably don't know the show, but in an episode of Scandal, the leading actress, Olivia Pope, who is a, 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 a politician cleanup woman, her father, who is a, a, a politician, a, a political, I'd say, henchman, okay? They're having a conversation. And she says to her father, she says, Dad, I don't get it. You know what? I'm frustrated. If everyone is corrupt, if everyone is evil, if everyone is out to get you, if everyone is messed up, then what is the point? What's the point? And the father's response is, well, it's because everybody's messed up. That's the point. It's because we're all lost. That's the reason that God sees fit. It's because we're all doomed. It's because we can't help ourselves. It's because everybody's corrupt. The ungodly that God is referring to, you don't know how bad it goes. You don't realize how bad we would be if God wasn't working in this world to keep us at bay. You don't realize how much we would kill one another. The point of God doing this is because there's no other way for it to be done. He's the only one that is qualified to be able to solve this problem. That's why when there's debate and dispute about whether Jesus is God, it blows my mind because you can't believe in Jesus and not believe that he's God. The reason I say this is because nobody else could have solved the problem. 
any human being would have always fallen short, even if he only spent one dollar out of his hundred dollars. Every single human being would have fallen short. We all have the same teaspoon of sugar. We're all going faster than 70 miles an hour. We cannot slap the backboard of the moon. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. So for him to come in and sacrifice his life is significant because it was the only way that we would have been saved out of this drama. There was no other way for us to do it. And he's demonstrating that loving someone is not predicated on them being lovable. You see, when human beings say, I love you, what they tend to mean is, I'm really enjoying what I'm receiving from you. I love how pleasing you look to me. You're so beautiful. I love having you on my arm. You cook for me and your food is so delicious. I'm talking to my wife if you haven't. <laughs> so I'm enjoying what I'm receiving from you. The reality is it would be better phrased for me to say, you really love me and I can feel it. Because all the things you're doing that make me so-called love you are actions towards me. It's a paradigm shift. It's a little difficult for us to twist that in our minds because we're so used to saying, I love you, I love you, I love you. But when we say it, most of the time, we're talking about what we receive from a person. But what God is teaching us here is that loving a person is a direction that, is, that consists of sacrifice towards the person. It's not what we can get out of the person, you see. And he demonstrates that. It demonstrates that we, when, when we talk about loving, it's not about doing things to, for people based on them deserving it, based on them, you know, demonstrating their lovability, so to speak. That's not what is, love is predicated on. Love is something that God has commanded us to do towards one another for the simple reason that he's trying to express his love towards all humanity, and he's engaging us. To do, this, to do that towards people. There are people that haven't been exposed to the love of God. They haven't been exposed to the love of God, they haven't heard. But if you've heard of the love of God, if you've been exposed to the love of God, all God is saying is, go out and love those people. Express the same love that I've expressed towards you, express that love towards them. Go out and love those people, and in doing so, they will experience the love of God, the unconditional love of God. Not the human kind of love, where you give me this and I give you that. You wash my back, I you scratch my back, I scratch yours. That's not the kind of love God is talking about. What he's teaching us here is a love that is not predicated on somebody deserving it, not predicated on somebody you know, earning it. And it's the love that he's given us, a love that we could never earn, a love that we don't deserve, a love that we actually, if, if, if we were supposed to get what we really deserve, we actually deserve death. What you see happening visibly, where people just are born and they die, they're born and they die, that's all we would deserve. To have children that grow up and die, grow up and die. There would be no hope of resurrection because our death would just pay for the sins of our life and that would be the end of it. But God loves us so much. And it breaks my heart sometimes to think that this person who loves us so much doesn't get first place in our lives. That he doesn't get top priority in our lives. And I'm guilty of it just like you are because we're all guilty of putting so many other things in our lives and giving them this top priority place when the only person that really deserves worship and adoration for the love that they've demonstrated is God. He's the only one that has truly, really loved us. We think we love our children, but we don't love them not nearly as much as God loves us. He's the only one that's ever truly demonstrated what true love is because he is love. And he put everything on the line. He left his comfort and his riches to demonstrate to us that that's what love is. So I'm not gonna draw it out. I hope I've been able to articulate to you this morning what loving is because we're in the same spirit this morning pastor you brought up the same topic 
that God loves us and you wanted us to understand how he loves us unconditionally. And I hope I was able to add a little bit to that initial seed that you planted. Please join me in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for loving us, for demonstrating the ultimate love for us. You've loved us in a way that we can never, ever express towards one another. But by your spirit and by your power, Father, we'll be able to do every sacrifice at every opportunity for one another. And we just want to thank you for being here with us today, for your spirit being with us. And may everybody leave here this afternoon just understanding a little bit more what it is to love. And we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen.